Hello, before I have a look at this article, and of course all links will be in the description, just want to give a shout out to Ninth Heretic uh, for passing this particular article on. And I'll put the link to her channel in description because, uh, again, smaller channel, nowhere near the views uh, given the research and some of the findings she has. Um, especially like looking at the early history of the Philfot. Uh, I won't use the S word because it's one of those things that gets maybe gets YouTube upset. But uh, looking at these very ancient connections between these symbols and then carrying up into uh, uh, Indian altars and these corresponding um, traditions and legends, how they sort of mirror each other, including Hestia and the fire of the half in the home, but also to um, in India, these ancient Indian traditions, uh, as well as up to, especially who's been a focus of her recently, is looking at uh, anthill traditions and also how they would connect even to the, um, uh, the prim prim primordial mound and so from Africa over to India, how especially connections between uh, well mushrooms, uh, umbrella which are umbrellas such as used in uh, in cathedrals and so, and uh, ant hills and serpents. So uh, check out her channel; it's definitely worth a watch. And there's some very interesting um, stuff uh, in there in regards to architecture and some other corresponding things. But the point here is this: so thanks again to Ninth Heretic. Links in descriptions. Uh, this article, uh, Rediscovering the Sources of Egyptian Metals, the first com comprehensive analytical data sets of copper-based museum artifacts, artifacts shed new light on provenance and production of Egyptian metal objects. So where did they get their metal from and how exactly did they make that? So it has, a, um, especially Egyptian copper, so I need to get this out of the way. When you hear there's a lot of stuff uh, in regards to copper, and cutting stone and then it can't be done well for, well again I'll, I'll revisit an older video I did on that um, in there but that's also based on a false fact because when they talk about copper they, they think of a copper that you get from the hardware shop for uh, electrical wiring or for piping no that's pure copper Egyptians didn't have pure copper they had arsenical copper and other copper alloys and so this article highlights a few pieces not only uh, also the size and the area of trade. So for instance, they found that um, by studying the uh, the impurities in the copper, they get a very good idea of exactly where it come from. So we have uh, some coming from an, in modern day Turkey and uh, also from the um, mess, well, all around the world, uh, not, not all of the world, but for instance, Mesopotamia, but uh, the Mediterranean and the areas surrounding that. And so when we talk about Egyptian copper, it's not pure copper. So those reconstructions where they use pure copper are not a uh, accurate description uh, at all um, in there. It's, uh, it's not just on one side, it's also on uh, the uh, mainstream will make reproduction. Anyway, we'll look at that shortly. But uh, talking about metal samples, where they came from, the impurities in there, and what's interesting is that... Uh, especially with sent sentence. Uh, we aim to understand how these objects were made and used within their particular ancient co context with arsenical copper alloys being a specific point of interest for these earliest periods because the old those old copper Egyptian chisels that they find are not pure copper. They're, they're a copper alloy, arsenical copper especially. So arsenical copper and bronze is very different from copper and bronze as most people would uh, be accustomed with it and they've also I talk again the, the trade routes and how far afield going back to pre old kingdom pre um, dynastic period and how these metals came from so this link will be in a description but uh, I can rehash some older videos so I've, I've, uh, I'll put the link to the full description in there but what we have is these ancient copper artifacts are not are never pure copper they are very very or they have impurities in them. So we have this ice axe of Ertzi, for instance, it's 99.7% pure copper. The overwhelming impurity is arsenic. If you add arsenic to copper, especially at these purities, and um, a lot to, more to be said about that, but it makes a different type of metal. It's not just normal copper. So his was an arsenical copper axe. If you add over 1% of arsenic, they define that as arsenical bronze. 
but uh, the copper that people think about is not the copper that these ancient tool makers were using. The copper we think about is copper wiring and copper pipes which are 99.9 .9 or 99.9% .9 pure. You cannot use these as an example of ancients. It's just way, way off. Uh, it's very, very different type of metal. Uh, for instance, half a percent of, of arsenic in copper means it's one third of as conductive, so it loses its value as for electronics. So that's why there's a, you know, they want to make pure copper for electronics. Not so long ago, arsenical copper was the standard. So before the electronical electronic age, arsenical copper was the and and they wanted arsenical copper because especially for steam, uh, you wanted um, it's much better material now. For instance, they made it out of copper because if you were to make the, the old burners and boilers out um, out of steel, for instance, uh, if you were to, if you put steam, pardon me a second. If you were to put steam through, um, pressurized steam through a steel pipe, it's going to tear through it like, like water through tissue. It's going to go right through there. What you need is arsenical copper. It was specified back at the time. It is a very different metal from pure copper. There's no interest in arsenical copper anymore because people want pure stuff. So also when you will see, if you look up copper artifacts from the ancients, whether it's Egyptians, Mesopotamia or, or uh, South America, South and Central America, never, never is it pure copper. It's almost always arsenical copper or some sort of alloy, which makes it very, very different from the soft copper that you're used to. Uh, if, if you made an axe or these with copper, it's just not going to work, you know. But that's what, how they did it back in, in the day. Uh, the, the, the copper from the Sinai Desert, for instance, is naturally rich in arsenic. And whether they added to it is an important article. So now they're in this particular article in these roots are now starting to look at what, how advanced was their metallurgy. Did they just use natural arsenical copper or were they adding to it? And this will be a very important feature because it, you know, we've, it, it shows that, you know, they're, they were more advanced than what generally they're given credit for. Uh, Peru. Where you have stone building cultures, you have arsenical copper. Now, if there's arsenical copper somewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a stone building culture, but there are no stone working peoples that did not have uh, access to arsenical copper. I have yet to find, well, there, there aren't that many ancient stone working cultures and they all had arsenical copper, so uh, it's not necessarily proof, but it is um, interesting nonetheless. Now, amongst the, uh, I don't like the term because I don't want to put everyone under the same umbrella, the lost high technology crowd. So this, this one would be way on, you know, ancient Egyptian technologies. It sounds, you know, it looks serious, it looks scientific -y, but there's no science here. This is, or this is pure rubbish because firstly, they claim that steel can't cut stone. What the hell are they talking? You know, every mason in the world uh, still now would, you know, what's he using magic? But they also say that copper cannot cut stone. Well, that's just not true. And um, so, for instance, this is, uh, I'll put the link to the fuller video because that's got links in the description. But for instance, this blacksmith was asked by National Geographic that they're making a documentary series to make some copper chisels. They specified pure copper. He, in his blog, points out, well, pure, pure copper is not very good. You actually want to have some impurities in there to make it a better tool to work with. But he gave them what they asked for and it worked. So they were able to split um, the stones with a, a pure copper chisel. But the fact is that the ancient Egyptians or Mesopotamians and um, people of South America weren't working with pure copper. They were working with impure copper, which an arsenical copper, which is significantly stronger and has different properties entirely. So now this isn't restricted to the lost high technology crowd, let's just call it that, it's an unfortunate term, but it is descriptive of of that general group, that's one of the buzzwords, but um, now uh, they often make poke fun at Mark Lerner, well so am I, because in this reconstruction where they're trying to construct, uh, make a sphinx's nose, they specify that they were using pure copper tools. There is no pure copper in ancient Egypt, they were using a, um, arsenical copper, arsenical bronze and other alloys. So 
from the get-go, this experiment reconstruction was doomed to fail. Uh, however, it didn't really fail in the end because you can cut um, limestone and other stones with copper as well. It's, it's you know, but it, it, even with steel, it takes time to carve stone. They gave them a couple weeks and a TV production deadline, and when it wasn't working, then they brought in power tools and finished it off. That's, again, that's not good. But um, I must, you know, like, uh, why would you use a, a chisel of that shape? to carve with because even if it was made out of steel and you're carving limestone this is what's, what's going to happen to your tool and it doesn't match the descriptions of these these are actual ancient egyptian copper chisels are uh, cynical copper chisels not pure copper you would but you would use something like this because this is not going to get the blunted end this is a poor choice of tool and probably poorly used i don't know apparently he was an expert in ancient tools yet he's you know, first day apprentice would get kicked off, you know, not kicked off side, he would be laughed at because he doesn't know what he's doing. And you don't use that type of chisel, it's, whether it's steel or titanium, it's going to bend uh, if you bang it with a hammer against another hard object. Um, there, there are still traditional sculptors who are carving in granite and they know how to do it. And they're, uh, they have many replacement chisels ready to go as where this whole thing with Mark Lerner, so the same people working on the stone and then when the chisel got bent or blunt, they would run off and then they would rework it and then they would run back again. This is why it was doomed to fail. This is, firstly, they were using pure copper and they were just poor work practices. There's no, there's no, no way around it. So again, if you want to look at the ancient, look at the traditional masons, uh, how they work. Um, not just with what they work with, but how they work. And this is just a poor example. So the nose was finished using modern tools, but again, poor choice of tools. They don't actually match the ones, arsenical copper tools. They don't match the material that was being used. And again, this is so, but even though it was bad experiment, bad reproduction, the pure copper does work and it can cut, cut the stone. So if three guys are chiseling at the nose, the, the same three people didn't just move from the front of a sphinx to the back you would have had teams working all along the way so we, if they had been operating in a more you know proper way where you have the apprentice fixing your tools and the and the and the mason keeps cutting and the and someone else is doing well firstly you're going to make it much more efficient and if you're using the right materials which actually match what they were, uh, the ancient finds that are being made there are very few chisels found because it was very precious metal uh, this is another argument. Oh, why aren't there millions of chisels all around? Because it was pressure. They, uh, workers would be have their chisel weighed at the beginning of the day and then weighed at the end of the day to make sure they weren't shaving bits off because copper was money. Again, this is not covered in many of the, the narratives. So uh, it's a us versus them thing. Uh, I got no love for Mark Lerner, but I got no love for the, for the other side as well because it's just bogus stuff. You know, it's um, it's... If, you, if you're going to uh, put something up and call it research, well, then you need to be able to, uh, to, firstly, to correct stuff when you know it should be corrected, but you still leave it up there. And, um, and you should know what you're doing beforehand anyway. So if you make definitive statements about cutting stone or lifting stone, and then you'll, yeah, do some homework, man. Just do, do some bloody homework. It's not hard. You have Google there. Does it, if you go onto the same couple of sites and just copy paste the same thing over and over again, that is not research. That's a that's a it's a cult. It's you know you need to look around and look deeper. And so it's not us or them. Mark Lerner failed on on this reproduction as well, but because uh, his failure works against the narrative of you can't cut stone with these tools. This isn't this hasn't been embraced. They still stay on the old narrative ah oh, ha ha you can't do it well you can and uh this if you want to go after him well go after him the fact that this um senior egyptologist is using pure copper but anyway so back those links will be in the article you can uh, follow through as well because to understand how things were done well let's look at the evidence uh and let's stick with the evidence the uh, ancient history is not some monolith exam uh, exemplified by zawi hawas there is, uh, there are many competing different ideas and new threads always being inserted into ancient history. This meme that ancient history is some sort of vast monolith of, of cover-ups is just 
false. It actually works the other way. Have a good one.